It is always a great honor to be able to share what you know with others and to be able to teach. And I really appreciate you spending your time with me here today. And I'm looking forward to sharing what I know about deep fakes, their implications for content creators, their implications for society and our future, and maybe even some opportunities that us entrepreneurs might have to help our society deal with this particular technology. Now, this video that I'm going to show you is in fact a deep fake. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right. Now the video you just saw never happened, or actually I guess I should say it only happened within the electronics of a computer. That's what deep fakes are, a synthetic performance that appears to be that of a known person. Now this video was made about three years ago and it was the first time that I really realized the dangers that deep fakes may pose for our society. It took a team of people, professional mics, professional cameras, and about 60 hours of compute time in order to create this voice and face swapping video. Now, I know that some of you, when you saw that video, either now or three years ago, knew that something was up. Um, there was some artifacts in the video. The color wasn't quite right. Parts of it were blurry, and certainly the content was not believable. And you may have been able to say with great confidence that you would not be fooled by such a video. But remember two important things about the digital world. Digital applications tend to improve at an exponential rate. Therefore, digital applications that were previously expensive and accessible by only a few quickly become cheap and democratized, available to many. Here's another deep fake, this one more recent. I'm going to show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. <laughs> this video only took one person about 24 hours to create. So you see what I mean? Better quality, faster to produce, and harder to detect that it is a deep fake. So now that we all understand what deep fakes are, I want to hit on four major themes in this short talk. How deep fakes are created, the positive applications of deep fakes, the dangers of deep fakes, and the opportunities for young entrepreneurs that deep fakes create. Now, I'm going to have someone else explain what deepfakes are for me. Deepfakes and lifelike avatars, like myself, are most often created using Generative Adversarial Networks, or GAN. These systems use two AI systems working against each other. One AI, the Generative Network, develops an image that predicts a person's appearance and sound when performing an action or saying certain words. The other AI, the Discriminator, acts as the judge to determine if the generator's work is acceptable. In the beginning, it takes a bit for the generator to get good at making images and sounds. Just like the first time you tried to draw an animal in art class, it didn't look like the animal you were trying to draw. But with feedback from your teacher, who knew what the drawing should look like, you got better and better. Likewise, with the help of the discriminator, the generative AI gets better and better very quickly, and pretty soon, its work makes it past the discriminator. That was obviously not a real person explaining what deepfakes are and how they're created, but is in fact an AI-generated avatar and is created in much the same way that a deepfake is. And this is one of the positive applications of this technology. For example, if I wanted to have this AI-generated avatar explain what deepfakes are and how they're created to a French audience, I could simply change the language and generate a new video. In fact, that's exactly what I did, and it only took about seven minutes to generate a French version 
of that short clip. Les DeepFAQ et les avatars réalistes comme moi sont le plus souvent créés à l'aide de Generative Adversarial Networks ou GAN. Ces systèmes utilisent deux systèmes d'IA travail. This technology makes it super easy to have little avatars that can explain concepts or can even guide someone to do some sort of process in their native language. The technology that I just used for that from Synesthesia is the name of the company. They offer over 50 languages right now and are continuing to expand their language base. There are lots of ways that this can be used in commercial applications as well. We probably have all watched foreign films in which the voices of actors have been re-recorded in our own local language, but the sounds and the lip movements just don't seem to match. Using this technology, a London-based company called Flawless.ai is able to visually translate foreign language films into any other language. This makes the film much more watchable as if the actors were native speakers. C'est amusant, monsieur. Non, au contraire. C'est tragique. Avez-vous réponse à ça Ils font leur bagage le matin. Ou même peut-être qu'ils n'avaient pas d'amis. Likewise, this technology could be used to help someone that's suffering from a neurological disease that's eroding their ability to speak. So they could record their natural voice, an AI could be trained on it, and then a voice synthesizer could be used as they progress in their disease. For example, we all know the synthetic voice of Stephen Hawking. That wasn't his real voice, but using this technology, he could have spoken to us not in that synthetic voice, but in a voice that was really his own. Now, for creators of podcasts and videos, there's a lots of opportunities here as well. Let me give you just one example. I'm sure you've recorded something and you've misspoken when you recorded a video or you recorded some audio. Well, now a US-based company called Descript has created the ability for creatives to actually edit their videos and audio using an AI clone of their voice. You train the system on your voice, and then you can make edits to your audio just as easy as you make edits to text or word processing. It saves a lot of time and money. Filmmakers are also using this technology for example, last year, for the production of the documentary Welcome to Chechnya, the directors used deep fakes to conceal the identity of some of the people that they were interviewing. This technique preserved the facial expressions of the interviewees, actually conveying their emotions while protecting their identity. Think about uh, the effectiveness of having a deep fake compared to having face blurred out, and a highly synthesized voice to conceal their identity. Likewise, Hollywood has been using this to bring back actors to life. So Peter Cushing, uh, who was in the 1970s Star Wars, was brought back in the 2016 Rogue One Star Wars series. It's also possible to bring back historical figures to life, showing them as they might have been, and even allowing them to speak about their lives, bringing history to life and providing context to their actions. The list goes on and on of the positive ways that we could think of using this technology, especially in creative industries. Unfortunately, the bad uses for this technology seem to be gaining more traction than the good. And probably the most damaging use of this technology has been to create pornographic images and videos without the consent of the people being depicted. Using only a few images or videos of a person, of a celebrity, of an ex-girlfriend, a hyper-realistic video can be generated showing the person doing any number of acts. This crime against women has devastating psychological effects on the victims, making them feel scared and humiliated. These crimes may also sabotage the victim's ability to find employment as employers often search the web prior to hiring someone. Now, deepfakes can also be used to portray a politician or a celebrity saying something that they didn't. 
In previous decades, news outlets would act as the gatekeepers of news and information and would be unlikely to publish something that they suspected as being fake, and it was much easier to detect if something was fake. But these hyper-realistic deepfakes pose a very new problem. You see, being first to break the news, being the first to break the story, is a big deal in journalism. And so if a journalist is handed some juicy video, some scandalous video of a politician doing something, especially leading up to an election, they might be inclined to publish that deep fake in a rush to be the first one to report it. However, a lot of people don't look toward traditional outlets for data or news. Instead, they look toward a variety of online sources, including social media. Deepfakes can spread rapidly through social media, where people look to their friends and connections as arbiters of the truth and facts. And unfortunately, social science shows that people share and remember negative information more than positive and they will give it more weight even if they find out later that it is fake. So a deep fake showing a politician doing something negative can make us inclined to think negatively about that politician even if we know later that that is a deep fake. The damage to the reputation of a company or person that a deep fake can cause is very real. And another concerning possibility is that deep fakes are eroding trust in our ability to be confronted with information that we disagree with. Okay, so if I see a video of a politician doing something and I'm not inclined to believe that that politician would do that, I might just dismiss it as a deep fake. So there's a politician that I like uh, and he does something negative, I might say, oh, well, that's just a deep fake. Undermining our trust in a political system or tarnishing the reputation of some politician doesn't have a lot of financial reward for the individual hacker or individual criminal. However, deep fake technologies are being used by criminals to pull off some elaborate schemes to defraud very large corporations. So what they're doing is they are making a deep fake audio of a person, uh, for example, the CEO of a major bank, and they're then having that deep fake call the CFO or the financial officer of that institution and tell them they need to transfer money into a certain account, that account being the, the account of the criminals who then take that money and they move it all over the world very rapidly. So there have been numerous cases of this. One case involving $10 million of a transfer that was not caught in time to reverse the transfer. So this can be extremely lucrative for criminals. Unfortunately, it's also coming down uh, to smaller amounts that these folks are scamming. So they're actually scamming individuals. So for example, if you were traveling to a different country, maybe they would do a deep fake of your voice back to your parents or back to your professor and uh, say that you were in jail and you needed some money wired or transferred immediately. Okay, so that is a uh, another bad way that this is being used. We talked about some of the good aspects of deep fakes and some of the bad aspects of deepfakes, and I think that the list of bad stuff is frankly uh, pretty scary. Uh, but I think that this technology actually creates numerous opportunities for young entrepreneurs. Obviously, the positive aspects of deepfakes opens up new channels for budding film directors, for creative artists, for um, creators of all types. But the negative applications of deepfakes also provide opportunities to develop companies and technologies that can help establish trust in the authenticity of the video and audio that we see online. Now, there's basically two approaches to combating deepfakes. The first is to develop a program, often a machine learning algorithm, to identify a deepfake. Now, there's a couple of problems with this approach. The first problem is getting enough training data. We have to have lots of deep fakes and we have to 
have lots of authentic videos, and we have to be able to train our algorithm to be able to recognize the difference. So getting a number and a variation of deepfake uh, examples can be difficult. Also, if we misclassify a real video as a deep fake or a deep fake as a real video, then we're going to contaminate our training data and that will make misclassification in the field when we actually go to use this algorithm more likely. We'll get more false positives and false negatives. Um, the other problem uh, with this approach is that it's really a moving target. Okay, deep fake technology is improving day by day, and researchers in this field say it's just an arms race, and they cannot guarantee that they're always going to be ahead of deep fakers. Certainly, it's much easier to detect a deep fake on a big platform like Facebook, where that deep fake is widely distributed and wild, uh, easily viewed. However, when you think about some of the examples that I gave earlier about scammers using it to target very specific employees at different businesses, well, that may be much more difficult to detect. So the second approach to combating deep fakes is to actually try to build trust into what is authentic online. So what are authentic videos and audios? Now, when a video or audio file is recorded, the recording and the associated metadata, you know, where it is uh, filmed, uh, how long it lasted, when was it filmed, all that kind of stuff, can be cryptographically signed and a unique identifier can be created that represents that file and all this metadata. We call this unique identifier a hash and it's very similar to the hashes that you may be familiar with uh, in passwords or in cryptocurrencies and other cryptography. Now there's a number of technologies, including blockchain, that allow any program to determine if the hash of a video that's being played that you're watching right now matches the hash of the video as it was originally recorded. That way we know if this video file has been altered. Likewise, if there were legitimate alterations to the video, for example, we did some editing, we did some color balancing or noise reduction, the history of those edits and the path back to the original video could be traced as well. Now for this to work, standards and means of interoperability are going to have to be developed and this technology has to be incorporated into our video recorders, audio recorders, and to all the things that play those types of files. So this technology certainly has the ability to help us discern what is real and what is fake, but cryptography and blockchain also provide some opportunities for actors and artists to control their likeness and work in some very interesting ways. Now you may have heard of NFTs, I pronounce them NFTs. These are non-fungible tokens and there's currently a lot of hype in this area, especially around NFT art or NFT art. And it's easy to kind of dismiss the hype and speculation around uh, these non-fungible tokens. Uh, but behind all these kind of wild stories and headlines is some very serious technology that can change how assets are created, sold, and traded. Today, using cryptographic signatures and blockchain technology, artists can issue a secure NFT, sometimes just referred to as a token, representing their creative work, images of themselves, or their voice. And they can do this with relative ease and little expense. In essence, each NFT is unique digital certificate of authenticity issued by the creator or holder of that asset. Now, NFTs don't necessarily prevent the duplication of a digital asset, but they do allow the creator to mint a digital token or tokens to represent an original copy. In this way, NFTs can prove ownership and license to use an asset as well as provide the authenticity of that asset. Now what's really neat about this is NFTs can also be used in smart contracts. So it's theoretically possible to include any number of provisions or restrictions on how a video or audio file might be used now or in the future. NFT contracts typically are made using the Ethereum platform, which includes a cryptocurrency known as Ether. Now Ether can be exchanged with US dollars, euros, South African RAND, 
uh, any other government issued currency. Uh, payments can be made automatically by combining the payment platform, the Ethereum platform, and the contract to use a particular asset. These smart contracts are also largely peer-to-peer -peer and include, can include any number of scenarios. For example, there's been one model who has written a lot about her inability to retain ownership over her image because photographers own all rights to the pictures, and what she's done is issued a selfie NFT in this way. Now, she could take this one step further and include that NFT in a smart contract. That would allow for future royalties coming back to her. It could terminate the use of the photo after a certain date, or it could do the opposite and allow the photo to enter the public domain at some point. Right now, the majority of what I've just described is in very, very limited use. And I think there's a huge number of opportunities for young entrepreneurs, young folks like yourself, to develop new technologies, to develop startups, and to develop ways to take these ideas to the next level and then incorporate them into the way we view and consume audio, video, and other files on the internet. Now to start out our question and answer period, I want to ask you a personal question. This technology is being used to bring to life people from the past. This can be done with even just one photograph. And I'm betting that everybody that is in this class has lots and lots of video and audio clips of themselves out there in the world somewhere. Now in 200 years from now, when you are long gone, would you want some distant relative to recreate you as a deep fake? Perhaps even combine with a conversational AI so you could almost be resurrected in some computer form? What do you think? Yes or no?